Reading from Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Father, we thank you again for this wonderful parable, just really one of the most beloved in your word. We pray that we will understand it. We pray that we will see, uh, Father, the depths of it, that you will cause it to become, to really grip our hearts, both as believers and certainly if there's anyone who's an unbeliever here this morning that you would grip, grip their hearts with the truth that is represented here in this parable. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you that none of us is here by accident. In your providence, you have worked out the fine details of our life. And so I pray that this will be a time when we are truly attentive to and open to the word that you have for us. I pray too, Father, that you will be with Uh, the many things that will be going on this week. We pray for Jesse as he goes on his own mission trip to India. Lord, as he trains others in how to translate the Bible using some of the applications and so on that he and his technical team are creating. We pray that there will be understanding. We pray that there will be just a renewed enthusiasm for how to get the word to people who don't have it. And Father, in our own hearts, create in us the, 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 the understanding of how privileged we are to have this, or to think that one day we will stand before you and give account. How will we explain that we were so casual about the word of God that, that was, has been in our hands all of this time? We're going to have a lot of explaining to do, I think. So Father, we pray that you will bless that ministry. Bless uh, the missionaries that we support around the world. We pray this think of the Sereds in, in Israel. And Lord, the, it's not an easy task there to be a Jew for Jesus as they, as they work with that organization. We hear regularly of places where they are pulled aside by some and beaten and in some cases uh, um, even worse because they are sharing the gospel. But we also thank you for the continuous increase in the number of people there who are coming to faith in Christ. Lord, we see you working in ways we would probably not choose, and yet they are your ways, and we submit to you, we humbly bow before you with thanksgiving for who you are. How grateful we are to belong to you. Use this day, use this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, and if you have not uh, already, please do turn to Luke chapter 15. A a wayward Catholic man had been kind of lax in his religious duties, went to confession one day, and he admitted that he had uh, stolen some lumber from the lumber yard where he worked. So the priest naturally asked him, well, how much have you stolen? And he said, well, I, uh, you know, I, I did get enough to build a pretty nice house for myself. But he said, that's a lot of lumber. He said, anything else? He said, well, I, I did build a house for each of my two sons. Anything more? He said, well, yeah, I built a house for my two daughters, and uh, there is that little cabin up on the lake. The priest said, man, you, this is incredible. He said, this is going to take uh, some serious penance. 
He said, have you ever done a retreat? And the guy said, well, Father, I a retreat. No, I've never done one. But he said, if you can get the plans, I can get the lumber. <laughs> we might surmise that that was something less than uh, true repentance, right? Repentance of suspect. God wants real, beloved. He looks deep into our hearts. He knows where we're coming from. He knows what's going on. And as we started this parable last week, we know that there really are two prodigal sons in this parable. They are both very different people, but they are both sinners. One is active and one is passive, but equally sinful. One sins by breaking the law, the other sins by keeping the law, as we will see a little later on in this series. But we began to look at this first son. We said we want to look at each of the three main characters here, the younger son, and we'll finish him today. Then we'll look at the father later, and then we'll look at the elder son. We are going to, we're going to take a little break in the middle because leading up to Easter, I want to do a little series on 1 Corinthians 15, the first few verses of that chapter. So beginning next week, we'll do that. If you're following along, you might begin to read that and begin to study that. But then we'll come back to this, to this uh, series on the prodigal sons. But today we want to finish up the last one. We said there are four things that we learned from this first young son, the younger one, the one that's obvious, the obvious prodigal. We saw, first of all, the repulsiveness of rebellion. So easy for us to think, well, just a little naughtiness kind of spices up life, right? But here we're seeing how repulsive any rebellion against God is. This boy wanted his inheritance. He wanted it in cash. He wanted it now. He didn't care how badly it reflected on the family. He didn't care the humiliation that this would bring to his father. He didn't care for the loss that would be suffered by having to liquidate land and sell it at a discount in order to do what he wanted. His, his actions, as we said last week, were tantamount to saying to his father, I wish you were dead. And in fact, he began to live life as soon as he got the money as though his father were dead. He ran off to the far country. He wanted to hide. He did not want to be accountable for his actions. He began to pursue his own pleasure with a vengeance. You know, it was life as one big fraternity party, big spring break, you know, wine, women, and song. That was his life, and everybody was his buddy. He threw off all the restraints at home, of home. Thought he had found freedom. What he had really found, of course, was the wages of sin, which is death. And it became obvious to him before long Sin promises freedom, but it delivers slavery. It promises happiness, but it delivers disappointment. The pleasures of sin are intense at times, beloved, but they are intensely short. We're, short, we're so short-sighted. We don't see that. We, we're in the middle of it. It just seems like the right thing to do. But when this man... When his money ran out, so did his friends. Notice verse 16, no one gave him anything. Everybody's gone. When he was the life of the party, they were all there, but now it's, now it's different. His money was gone, his friends are gone, but his life goes on. And the repulsiveness and the waste of the actions that he has chosen begins to come home, begins to be obvious. But the point, of course, of the parable is that the same is true for anyone who's not investing in eternity. It was the same for the man in Luke 11 who was a rich man, and he saved it all up. He didn't spend it or squander it like this man did, and yet, think about the end result. What was his end result? Why did he save his money? So that he could eat, drink, and be merry. So that he could do the same thing that this young man did, just doing it in a different way. And so are all of us when we do not lay up treasure in heaven, when our existence is totally around this life. Rebellion against God's ways, beloved, is a no-win game. It doesn't matter how you play it. In the end, it's a no-win game. 
It doesn't matter really what success or failure you have in this life. What counts is what have you laid up for the life to come? Because you're gonna be there a lot longer than you will be here. So we saw the repulsiveness of rebellion. Secondly, we saw the ravishness of regret. Payday eventually comes. For this young man, it came when he suddenly found himself as a nice Jewish boy sitting in a pig pen, wishing he could eat the things that the pig, pigs were eating. That's about as low on the ladder as you could go as a young Jewish boy. His father's house of plenty was a distant memory by that time. And he had no one, absolutely no one to blame but himself. That was a bad scene. But once again, of course, the parable is pointing, pointing us toward the reality that will be there for all of us who have lived for self our whole life, who have rejected Christ in this life as not just Savior, but as Lord of our life who have put our trust in something that we can do and something that we can have only to find ourselves in eternity separated eternally from God, wishing eternally for a do-over of one moment, that one moment when we could have come to Christ in faith, when we could have given our life to him, but we did not. Imagine the awfulness of that kind of regret. The moment that you rejected Christ will be before your eyes forever. The greatest news of, that's ever come to mankind is this. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to. And so that brings us to the last couple of points here today. First of all, the reversal, the third point really, the ver- reversal of repentance. The reversal of the rep- repentance. Two things happened that stopped this young man from his free fall into destruction. First of all, he came to himself, and then secondly, he came to the Father. And he did it in time. He did it in time. It's important to do it in time. Look at verse 17, he came to himself. But when he came to himself, when he returned, to reality, when his mind began to work correctly, he began to see things as they really are. It ta- you know what? It takes faith to do that. It takes faith to do that because your mind will tell you, your natural existence will tell you, well, I should get as much as I can in this life. Phys- physical perceptions is the way we see the world. And so it's only natural that we think what I need is whatever I can get. What I need is the things that will attack my senses and that will be pleasurable to them. Eat, drink, and be merry is a great philosophy from that standpoint. But this man began to see that where his senses lead, led wasn't very good. If there is a life to come, as the Bible certainly presents that there is, there's more to this. And in the pig pen, he had plenty of time to think about this. And he came to himself. And as he came to himself, it reversed things. That's what repentance is all about, right? It reversed his outlook. It reversed his direction. It reversed his actions. Rather than running from the Father, which is what he'd been doing, now he's about to turn and run to the Father. You know you've come to yourself when you really begin to want God. Until that moment, you're living in some fantasy land. Because God is reality. God is what is real. God is what is important, both in this life and certainly in the life to come. And when he came to himself, this is what he began to see. Now, there are three things in this passage that help us understand what it means when it says he came to himself. He saw three things that he hadn't seen before. He saw, first of all, that he was perishing. He saw that where he was going was leading to nothing good. And so look at verse Oh, I think it's 18, but when he came to himself, 17, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish. I perish. This is where going my own way has gotten me. Things look a lot different as he's coming to himself. The far country looked far better when he was at dad's house and he'd never been anywhere. 
He was absolutely sure that he could carve out a better existence for himself than he was having at his father's house. He knew that his own way would be the better way. He was tired of all the commands that were coming from the father. He believed that he could improve himself and that he could be happier and that he could do better. But all that he proved, beloved, is that there are a million ways to perish. There's only one way to life. It's fascinating dialogue in John 6 that's something like this. Turn there. If you're in Luke, just a few pages over there to John 6. This is the, this is, this is the account where Jesus feeds the 5,000 men plus women and children out of the two loaves and five, five loaves and two fish. Jesus has fed these people. Then overnight he goes away. But they chase him down the next day. <clears throat> and they're back looking for more. Jesus sees right through them. So let's start off in John 6. Um, well, let's start off about verse 26. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. I know why you're here. You want more food. Verse 27. But do not work for the food that perishes. The word, the food that perishes. But work for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man, Jesus' words for himself, of course, will give to you. Jesus is asking them to believe in him. He's saying, I have something far more important than more physical bread to give you. I know you enjoyed that. I'm glad you enjoyed that. But I have something far better. I have eternal bread to give you. I have eternal life to give you. But you know what's interesting is if you read through this, I'm just going to summarize the next few verses, but you can see that what they say to him basically is something like this. They said, well, listen. Okay, so you fed 5,000 of us yesterday. Big deal. We have an ancestor, Moses, who fed 2 million of us in the wilderness for 40 years every single day. Don't think you're such a big deal. That's the essence of what they say to Jesus. Imagine that. Jesus answered very simply. He said, I think there's two things you folks ought to understand. The first one is Moses didn't feed your ancestors in the wilderness. My father did that. It's my father who fed them. But he said, the second thing you need to understand is that I can offer you bread that lasts forever. I can offer you eternal life, eternal bread. This is what you need. But they still didn't get it. So in verse 34, they answer this way. They say, sir, give us this bread always. And that's when Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Obviously, they're talking at one level about physical need. Jesus is talking a whole different level about spiritual need, about that which lasts forever, about that which is permanent, about what's, that which is eternal. He's basically saying to them, listen, anything I give you in this life, anything, anything you get in this life, even manna that flows for 40 years is going to come to an end one day. But I can give you life. I can give you contentment. I can give you satisfaction that will never end. It will never run out. It will never perish. That's what I offer you. And that hope is me. It's me. You must know me. You must commit to me. You must have a relationship with me. These people, just like the prodigal, just like all of us, must realize that there is nothing in this world that can save us. And yet so many of us spend our whole life thinking that if I can just get this, this is the thing that will save me. Only Jesus can save us, beloved. And as he sits in this pig pen, the prodigal is no longer, he's not, he's not thinking about the next party anymore. He's come to the end of that tree. He's finally figured it out. 
Even if I get the job, even if I get the promotion, even if I get the, the, the thing that I think I want most in life, even if I think the relationship with this person is the thing that's gonna save me. It's come to the realization there's nothing in this life that can save. So it is with anything that we will pursue in this life as the ultimate thing. Augustine had it right when he said it this way. He said, he cannot, he said God wants to give us something, but he cannot because our hands are full. There's nowhere for him to put it. That's right. That's why Jesus says that he that comes to me, one whoever, whoever's the one who wants to follow me, man, woman, child, he who follows me must deny himself, empty his hands, Take up his cross daily and follow me. Worldly idols can only lead to ultimate destruction and this young man is now finally discovering that. Have you discovered that? Second thing he saw was that he was a sinner. Not only was he perishing, but he saw that he was a sinner. Verse 18. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned. I have sinned. I have sinned against heaven and before you. This is the key to the passage. He's now seeing himself for who he was. Seeing the reason that he's perishing is because he's a sinner. He's been living before this in some existence that was taking him down a false road. He didn't have a true view of reality. been living in fantasy land. A lot of people live in fantasy land. They think because they're not a great sinner, they're no sinner at all. But central to the whole message of the gospel, beloved, is repentance, turning from sin to Christ. And you can't do that until you realize, yeah, I really am a sinner. I may be even pretty good outwardly, and compared to everybody else that I know, I may be wonderful. But when I really look into my heart where God always looks, what selfishness can I find there? What lasciviousness can I find there? What greed can I find there? What covetousness? What hatred? What, what grudges am I harboring there? He realized he was a sinner. Now, look at, look at the language here because it's very important. He says, I have sinned against heaven. Before he even mentions his father, he mentions heaven because that's significant. At its core, all sin is ultimately against God. It's ultimately against God. Remember when David confessed his sin about his sin against Bathsheba and her husband Uriah, sin of adultery with Bathsheba, the sin of murder against Uriah. I mean, it was as sordid a tale as you could find anywhere, right? And there it is right in the middle of the Bible with the man whose heart, who had a heart that God said was a man after his own heart. And yet he could sin like that. God's showing us we can all sin like that. When David confessed his sin, what did he say? It's in Psalm 51, verse 4. He said, against you, you only have I sinned. Well, hadn't he sinned against Bathsheba? Hadn't he sinned against Uriah? And of course, the answer is yes, he had sinned against them. His sin had been great against them, but by comparison to his sin against God, it was nothing. The person whose character he violated, who was the creator of all things, was God himself. And so David recognized my sin is first and foremost the sin of violating God. All sin is. The thing that will, I think, most bring us most quickly to the feet of God, looking for repentance, looking for mercy, begging for his grace, is the realization that even the little things that we think are not important are absolute violations of God. It's not so, matter, uh, so much a matter of breaking the rules. Yes, this young man eventually broke some rules, but in his heart, he's now getting the picture against you, against heaven I have sinned. He's saying, you know what, God, I, I wanted to be in charge of my own life. I wanted to be my own master. 
I thought I could write my own ticket. I thought I could make my own way. I, don't, I didn't want you to tell me how to live my life. Notice all the I's and the my's and the me's and the first person pronouns. That's what it is to be in rebellion against God. Sin is at its heart a heart issue, not a behavior issue. Yeah, the behaviors are bad. And yes, the behaviors hurt other people, including ourselves. But that's not where it starts. That's not the worst part, not even close. The worst part is what is in our heart. The worst part is where it starts. And this young man has finally come to that realization. That's the main point of this whole parable. When Jesus wants to give us an example of someone who is a lost sinner, he doesn't give us a serial killer or a rapist or somebody that we would put on the scale at the top of the scale of a sinner. He gives us a kid who wanted his own way. We have all been there, have we not? That's who he gives us. Yes, the things that the young man did were shameful, but it was the relationship that was the nightmare. And that's what God is trying to point out to us. He was saying, this young man, when he left home, Father, I want your things, but I don't want you. I want your blessings, but I don't want your person. I want what you can give me, but I don't want to live under your headship. That's what our rebellion against God looks like, beloved. Sin is less about breaking God's laws than it is about breaking away from God. It, 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 I mean, when you, when you really, when you begin to understand, as this young man did, as he came to himself, sin is the in, insane desire to stay in control. What was the very first sin ever in history? What did Satan say in Isaiah 14, the first sin that we know about in the history of the universe? Satan said this, I will set my throne on high. I will make myself like the most high. I'll be my own God. I will be in control, thank you, going forward. That's sin. That's where it starts. The rest of it is sort of immaterial in a way. When I have set myself up against the God who created me, I have, I have sinned as badly as is possible to sin. What did God, when did Satan come to Adam and Eve? What was the temptation with them? Eat this and you'll be like God. And so Eve believed it and took it and ate because she wanted to be like God. Don't let God control you. Be your own God. That's what we want. You know, this, this blows moralism right out of the water. Moralism says, well, just be good on the outside, you know? I, I, some of us could sit here this morning and say, well, I'm, a, I'm not immoral. I'm a good person. Ask my neighbors. Everybody who knows me would say, I'm a good person. I pray once in a while when things get tough. I go to church occasionally if it's not inconvenient, if there's not a game on, whatever. I'm a good moral person. But beloved, if that's your life, if you give God half a day a week, a couple hours on Sunday morning, and if the rest of your life could be lived the same way, even if he didn't even exist, if that's your life, you're committing the worst sin you can commit because you're living as though God didn't exist. You're living as though you wished he were dead. You have blown God off. And when it comes to relationship with the Lord where we've blown him off and we think that the rest of our righteousness is somehow gonna cover it, we're in serious, serious trouble. Our sin is primarily against the Lord. Another way that I think this parable invites us to look at this is this. Sin is, sin is not just living as though God didn't matter. It's also living as though, it's also seeking a home where there is no home. This young man was trying to find a home in a far country rather than in God's presence. Home is kind of in the Bible. It's really another way of saying relationship. 
And that's where the prodigal son comes to his senses and he realizes, here I am with nothing. <laughs> Even the servants in my father's house have it way better than I do at this point in time when I've come to the end of myself. He thought he could find a home, a place of acceptance, a place of security, a place of warmth, a place of, of, of attachment, a place to belong. He thought he could find all of that in sex and pleasure and the things that he could give his life to in the far country. And the parable was about the fact that he finally woke up to reality and realized he'll never find it there. It's only to be found in the relationship with the Father. Home is where the Father is. Nothing in this world can ever be home. C.S. Lewis said it so well when he said this. He said, creatures, listen to this carefully, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly desires were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it to suggest the real thing. What he's saying is if we got scratches, it can't be itched by all the money in the world, by all the ambition in the world, by getting the everything that we think we wanted and it just doesn't satisfy, chances are there is something further out there that does satisfy. And what he's saying is it's the relationship with God. That's the thing. The prodigal son now sees himself for who he really is, a violator of the father's heart. And because he's come to himself and he's really seen that, he sees his need for a savior and he's ready. How we have to come to that point, beloved, before we can be saved. He sees the third thing here. He saw that he was perishing. He saw that he was a sinner. And now he sees one more thing, and this is very important. He sees that he is unworthy. He sees that he is unworthy. This is where true repentance really enters the picture. It's in verse 19 now. He says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He's thinking about what he's going to say when he gets to his father. I am unworthy. Jesus put that phrase in that parable for a purpose. He wants us to understand that it was critical for this young man to realize that he wasn't worthy and that there was nothing he could do to get worthy. Just as all of those who will come to, to become children of God have to at some point realize, you know what? I am unworthy to be a child of God. And I can never get myself worthy to be a child of God. The more you think you can get yourself worthy to be a child of God, the further you are from being one. That's the easiest way to say it. There's nothing we can do to meet God's standards. There's, no, there's nothing we could do in our life. There's nothing we could give in our life. There's no time. There's no effort. There's no money. There's no project. There's nothing we can do to earn God. You think you can really put God in debt to you? Surely not. But you see, the opposite side of that is you have to be willing to say, okay, I, I, I acknowledge I'm not worthy. I, if I'm going to have salvation, I'm going to have to throw myself on God's mercy to think that we can make God owe us blows the whole thing sky high. We're not worthy. The scribes and Pharisees thought they were worthy. They would have looked down on this prodigal and said, you want to come home? You want to come home? Here's what you can do. You've got to earn your way back. Every penny you took, you're going to have to pay it back with interest. This young man on his own had no possibility that he could ever do that. But he was ready to go now because he was ready to throw himself on his father's mercy just to obtain a place as a servant. This is true repentance. This is true repentance. This is heart 
felt repentance. This is from the depth of my being, repentance. I am not worthy. Listen to this. I'm gonna mention this guy by name, sorry. He deserves it. Robert Schuller's book, Self-Esteem, The New Reformation, was on the bestseller list a few years ago. If you got it, please burn it. <laughs> he had an amazing statement. Schuller made his own theology up, you see. He sounded good a lot of times, but his theology was sin is a lack of self-esteem. I just need to think higher of myself. And it reflects itself in this statement. That's what his book was all about. He said, once a person believes that he is an unworthy sinner, it is doubtful if he can really honestly accept the saving grace God offers in Jesus Christ. That's heresy, beloved. You can't read this parable and understand that. The first thing the young man said was, I'm unworthy. That's what made him worthy. Jesus teaches it's only when you know that you are unworthy that you will accept the saving grace of, Jesus, of God in Jesus Christ. Until then, you'll be trying to earn your way. You'll be thinking there's something you can do. You'll be convinced that if you just get it right, God will have to take you. That is, <laughs> well, it's so foreign to the Bible. It's so foreign to this parable. It's so foreign to the teaching of Christ. We, it becomes possible for God to extend his grace to us the moment we say I'm unworthy. But as long as we're saying I can do this, God's going to say fine, go for it. All you got to do is be perfect. We asked the question in our Bible study the other night, can you be saved by keeping the law? We all answered no. And then we all realized, well, yeah, you can be saved by keeping the law. All you got to do is be perfect. All you got to do is do it outwardly perfectly. All you got to do is do it in your heart perfectly. All you got to do is never have a bad thought, never have a bad deed, never have a bad word. All you got to do is be perfect. Good luck. God's already declared us unworthy. It's only when we agree with him. That's what confession means, to agree with God. When we agree with him, we become now candidates for the grace of God in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful thing. This is good news beyond good news. I can't do it myself, but he will do it for me. The moment I declare myself unworthy. You know, and, and there's a little detail in here that's interesting in verse 14. Notice it. He says, there's a severe famine. You know, you kind of ask yourself, why did Jesus throw that little detail in there? Just to kind of enhance the story? I don't think so. I think he's demonstrating that disasters are intended to help bring people to this point to see that they're not in control of the world. They're not in control of the way things go. We're not in control. God is in control. Help bring this man to the end of himself so that he finally came to the place where the only place he could turn for help, he realized, was to the Father. The end of self is the beginning of salvation. When he saw himself as unworthy, he was ready to receive the grace of God and not until then. So he came to himself, and those are the three things, saw himself as a perishing, saw himself as a sinner, saw himself as unworthy. So what did he do? He came to the Father. He came to the Father. He came to himself first and saw what he was, but now he saw the Father, and he saw their love, and he saw grace, and he saw mercy, and he said, maybe. We don't have to say maybe. He's demonstrated his love for us, but this young man said, I think, I got, here's the reversal. The father that he left, he now returns to precise picture of repentance. Precise. Repentance means to turn from my way to God's way. Change my mind, to give up my worldview for God's worldview. It means to do a 180 degree turn from who I, what I think is right and what I think is gonna be good for me to follow his way, to obey him to make him the Lord of my life. 
to allow him to be God in my life, not just God in the universe. This young man came to his father. And I love the way Jesus says it here. He doesn't say he came to his, back to his country. He doesn't say he came back to his village. It doesn't even say that he came back to his home. It says he came to his father. It's all about the relationship. came to his father. This is beautiful. The father that he had violated, that he had rejected, that he had humiliated. The father that he said, I, my way is better than yours. That father, that relationship that he had trampled underfoot, he now has come to treasure. That's what it means to come to God through Jesus Christ. It remains to treasure, it means to treasure the God who created us and the God who gave his life for us and the God who stands willing to save us if we will just come to him. Real repentance is when someone runs to God rather than away from God. It should cause us to ask, well, which way am I going? Am I going toward God or am I going away from him? You know, when I was a kid, I was a little bit envious of some guys that lived across the street from us. They were good Catholics. And um, I'm not picking on Catholics this morning, but I'll tell you what those guys did. They would, they would go out during the week and they would, you know, do whatever. Steal baseball cards, you know, bully little kids around, steal bicycles, whatever. When they got a little older, get drunk, do whatever they wanted. Then on Saturday, they'd go down to confession. They'd get absolution. And then the next week, they'd go back and do the same thing all over again. I thought that was pretty cool. I didn't understand what the relationship is about for a while, see. It wasn't true repentance. It was running from God on the basis of a false confession. We can do that. If it's not real from your heart up, if you don't have a longing for God in your heart, you know, your salvation is suspect. This young man ran to the Father because that's what those who are saved do. That's what those who have come to the end of themselves and realize that there is nothing they can do for themselves, that's what they do. They come to the Father with absolutely no conditions attached, no strings, no expectations, no demands, no negotiations. They come to the Father and throw themselves at his feet in humble confession and repentance. Have you done that? Do you belong to the Father? Do you have a relationship with him that you treasure above anything else? There's an old story Spurgeon used, used to tell it since he was English, I assume it's true, I don't know, but he said there was an English king who had some rebellious subjects in Calais part of France, which England always used to claim was theirs. And the king of England got in control of Calais and he came and he was going to hang these six guys that were the head of the rebels over there. But on the day that's supposed to happen, the rebels came in, they gave themselves up and they came with, with, with ropes already around their neck, essentially saying, hey, we acknowledge that we rebelled against you. And the king saved them because of their submission. That's what we do with the Father. Beloved, we come dying to self. Letting him, you know, acknowledging to him, look, I went my way. It, it's not the right way. Your ways are right. I now value your commands. I value your person. I want you. That's what it means to come to Christ. And then we have fourthly in, in, this, in this parable what? The rapture of rejoicing. <laughs> the rapture of rejoicing. Look at it in verse 24. They began to celebrate when that young man got home. It's the continuation of verse 10, right? That we looked at before, verse 10 in that chapter in Luke 15, where when the, um, when the shepherd had found the sheep that were lost, he came and says, just so, in verse 10, just so I tell you, there's joy before the angels of God over one sinner who, repent, who repents. One repentant sinner sets off a celebration in heaven. Isn't that amazing to think about? 
looked at Zephaniah, how God sings over those who come to faith in him, how much God loves us. In the end, his holiness requires judgment on those who will reject, but his heart desires repentance. And when he finds a repentant sinner, he's, it sets the heart of God on fire. Because he loves his creation. Wish we could develop that this morning. We, we can't. We're at the end of our time. But how do we come to Christ? Well, the prodigal came to himself, saw the sinner that he really was. And then he came to the Father. He saw him for the loving Father that he is, the provision that he makes. His confession, his repentance was real. A woman came up to Charles Wesley one time. She said, I'd like you to pray for me. I'm a great sinner, and I, I, wish, you would, I wish you would pray for me. <laughs> Wesley sensed that she was kind of a celebrity hound even in those days, right? And he realized that she wasn't very real. So he said, yes, I will pray for you. He said, you need it. You are indeed a great sinner. And she looked at him and said, well, I'm not that bad, right? But we are, see, we are that bad. And the only way we can have the Lord's grace in our life is to come and confess that and acknowledge it to him. Reverse the way we think about ourselves and the way we think about the Father. I hope you've done that. Come to faith in him. Repent of your sins. Come like the prodigal did to the Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. Lord, for those I trust most of us who are here this morning who have truly at some point in our lives given our, our hearts in faith and in trust to you. But Lord, now the question is, are we really living like that? Are we living the good of that? Or do we still live lives that pretty much ignore your existence? That if you looked at us the rest of the week, you wouldn't see much difference between us and the rest of the world. Forgive us. Bring us once again to your cross in humble confession and repentance. To say, I want to live for the Father who has loved me so much. And Lord, for those who are here this morning who have never given their life to you, they're still in a, their heart is still in a state of rebellion. Or they're, they're probably good people or they wouldn't be here at all. They wouldn't be showing up at church on a Sunday morning. But Lord, their heart, their heart is running from you. I'm just praying right now, Father, that you'll cause their heart to respond. By your grace, through your mercy, will you turn the heart that rebels against God to be one that will treasure a relationship with you that can come by faith alone. It could happen right now. Help them to turn and say, I acknowledge my sin. Thank you for dying to pay the price for my sin so that I can have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for those who will do that. Give their heart to you right now, I pray, Father. As you accept them, will you give them the grace to live? in the good of what they have now made their life's commitment. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace that never ends. Help us as we sing now, Father, to make this from the bottom of our hearts, the prayer of our heart, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.